stop by and pick it up just like after the first exam. So we've been talking about mutation. There's a very important concept that goes with mutation, and that is mutation rate. And so mutation rate is equal to mutations created minus <coughs>
bacteria DNA O1 that we've already talked about comes in and following the standard DNA replication rules, that is 5 prime to 3 prime, DNA O1 now is going to extend of the 3 prime hydroxyl here and just fill in this gap. This is a short gap. But just like during replication, when an Okazaki fragment is made, DNA pole one is going to bump <coughs> into that section of DNA. And now we have a nick that has to be fixed by DNA ligase. So we have a whole bunch of enzymes. We have an enzyme that makes a cut. We have DNA pole one. We have DNA ligase. We see each one of these during replication and during recombination. So these are all pleiotropic enzymes. They are involved in multiple phenotypes. The phenotype of replication, the phenotype of recombination, the phenotype of DNA repair. So once we seal this nick, everything is back the way it was. We now have keys back here. But it's imperfect because DNA pole 1 is not as accurate as the replication enzyme. And it can make a mistake. It's just that simple. Any question on damage repair? Yes? An enzyme that participates in multiple phenotypes. So a phenotype replication, recombination, repair. Is this what occurs in our cells as well? Or just, just so, so you've got, you've got yeah. enzymes comparable to each one of these. Yes. And so this is your first line of defense. This is E. coli's second line of defense. Against not only thymine dimers, but against anything. So any mistakes, anything that is not A, T, G, or C, <coughs> that's what that's looking for. So uracil in the DNA. Any of those damaged bases that we talked about, mutagens, chemicals that damage the DNA, anything that's not an A, T, G, or C is going to be recognized. You, your genes code for a, a huge number of proteins. Each one looks for a specific piece of damage, a specific structure. <coughs> And when it finds it, it just sits down there as a beacon and calls in this repair system. Does it? Does the repair not require an RNA primer? It does not, oh. because where I started here, we've got a three prime hydroxyl. Okay. The way the cut is made, it makes a three prime hydroxyl, and so it's just perfect to get picked up by DNA pole one. So primer is not necessary. What? Uh, a, a nuclease, and there are a lot of nucleases, and I don't want to start going through names. Uh, just, we're just looking at the general pathway. Anybody else? Yes? Well, I mean, there, there are more proteins involved, especially in the recognition, and then signaling back. Remember, <coughs> DNA damage is going to halt the cell cycle. So DNA damage 
does a lot of things. We're just focusing on repair right now. But if, if you're getting ready to replicate, you've got to halt things until you fix this up. We talked about that last week. Anybody else? So this is DNA's damage. Now let's look at replication error. As I said, the replication enzyme is very, very good, but no enzyme is perfect. <coughs> So let's put an A here. And we'll just look at that one strand. We don't care about the other side. Now we have a replication mistake. And so this is not AT or GC base pair. So the error recognition system is completely separate from the damage replication system. Damage just looks at a single base. Error looks at base pairs. There are only two base pairs. And so now the error machinery is going to call in a different mechanism it's going to look very similar, but it's a totally different set of genes, a totally different set of enzymes. We're doing this in E. coli, but you have comparable systems of all the imperfect repair systems that we're going to talk about. So you've got a system that does this, and you have a system that looks for this. And so the system is going to look very, very similar. We're going to make a cut, a cut, and we have to strip away. Now the question is, how did the system know that the C was a mistake? It doesn't. In bacteria, the way that happens is because the DNA is methylated. So these X's represent a methyl group added to the DNA. And they're going to be on both strands. And so now, let me put this back in. What you see is that the new strand is different from the old strand. The new strand is not methylated. The old strand is methylated. So that's what the error repair system looks for. This is in E. coli. It's called methyl directed repair, because the system is going to repair the non-methylated strand. Otherwise, it's going to have to flip a coin. 50% of the time it gets it right, 50% of the time it gets it wrong. But with the methylated DNA, now we can take that out and do everything exactly the way we did there. DNA hole one comes in, fixes it up. <coughs> hole one and ligase seals the nip. And so it looks exactly like that, except this is a long gap. So we have a short gap there. For some reason, Totally unexplainable. Error repair pulls out a big chunk of DNA. Damage repair pulls out a short chunk of DNA. Simple and straightforward. Almost the same 
as damage repair. Any questions? Yes. Which one would it do if it just like skipped a base? Ah, skipping a base is interesting. So that's going to be error. Oh. And so it'll recognize that because the structure is warped. And, and that'll be taken up. We have a bigger problem. E. coli doesn't have any homopolymer runs and, and simple repeats like we do. So our system is more attuned to look for skipping a base and adding extra bases. But apparently they do get through because we have those expansions that we talked about. No, 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 no. Cuts what 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 occurs. The protein is not called cut. No, it's because I didn't want to give you more names to remember. It's, it's just that simple. Uh, so the, the damage so it makes the long gap and the, the uh, that one makes a short gap. So error is a long gap, damage is a short gap. Can I say it backwards? Yeah. 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 <coughs> the top one, damage is the short gap. Which doesn't make sense to me. I would think the damage would be bigger than the whole gap. Yes? I don't understand how the methyl is strength. Oh, because the enzyme is walking along the DNA, and so it's going to check not the methylated strand, going to check the non-methylated strand. It's not going to touch the methylated strand. Why is it methylated? Because that's the way the system is able to tell the repair gene which strand to look at. So it can distinguish new from old. And, and the why part gets complicated. Uh, this may not be the original function of methylated DNA. Maybe something else we're not going to talk about. Absolutely, you're, you're exactly right. And so the way the system works is if the white cord is moving, the system waits about 10 or 15 minutes and then methylates the, the new strand. So that down here, both strands are methylated. But there's, there's a time pause to allow checking to occur. Humans have, we, you and I have, metha, and her, have methylated DNA. Our error repair system absolutely does not use it. Nobody in the world knows how our system distinguishes old from new. That's an, an ongoing puzzle problem in molecular biology. <laughs> So gap filling in any E. coli is done by coli one. Both, both gap fillers. Yes? Uh, would partner shift is going to be Partner shift is going to be an error because it's going to have an incorrect base pair during replication mode. Now the chances, I don't, I don't think anybody's ever designed an experiment because it happens so fast. Uh, to look at it outside of replication. The replication of the polymeric shift uh, actually changed the DNA sequence. Does this, this mechanism only occur during replication? Uh, you mean a replication error? No. No, damage. We, we talked about damage already. Anything that gets into the cell may damage the DNA. Replication error is replication, but it's also repair because if a mistake is made here, then you're back to square one again. If a, if a mistake is made here, you're back to square one again. But here, again, it depends on the timing of methylation. Anybody else? So this is your first line of defense against replication errors. And E. coli's first line of defense against replication error. So this is imperfect repair. It picks up 
anything that is not supposed to be in the DNA. There's an interesting set of enzymes called error-prone detail. So for finding, di for finding dimer damage, your first line of defense is not photoreactivation, activation, it's this mechanism. This is going to be your second mechanism against thymine binders. And so here, if we have if we have a thymine dimer, replication is going to come down. The replication enzyme cannot cross the thymine dimer. The structure is so warped that what happens is an error-prone DNA polymerase. If this is E. coli, this is DNA called 4 or 5. It's going to come in and just put garbage in there and then turn it back to DNA pole 3, the replication enzyme. When I say garbage, I mean the error-prone replication enzymes do not read the sequence on the template. They just put any base in, because an unrepaired thymine dimer is lethal. So the question for the cell is, do we just automatically keel over and die, or do we try to fix it with anything there, and then undergo recombination because now you've got two good strands on the other side. I'm not going to go into that. Just imagine recombination. You're going to replace one of those damaged strands with an undamaged strand from the sister chromosome, and then they can both be repaired. So it's a complicated mechanism. All cells have it. For bacteria, this is a third line of defense against thymine dimer. PRE is number one. Standard damage control is number two. And an error-prone repair is number three. For you, the error-prone system is your second line of defense against standard repair. And you have more error-prone polymerases than does E. coli. Yours are more complex. We're not going to go into the mechanism. That's just the standard mechanisms that the cell has to look and repair different kinds of things that don't belong in the DNA. So whether it's damage, non-standard bases, or whether it's non-standard base pairs, they're handled by two different systems. Any questions on this? Double-stranded breaks. Double-stranded breaks, like thymine dimers, if not repaired, can be lethal. A double-stranded break in E. coli is going to linearize the chromosome. A double-stranded break in eukaryotes is going to lead to translocations, inversions, deletions, all kinds of problems but typically not duplications. And so all cells, again, universal, have a very complex mechanism to handle it. In bacteria, there are no natural ends. So in bacteria, any end of a chromosome is treated as though it were a broken end. For your chromosomes, because you have real ends of chromosomes, your ends are distinguished from breaks because of your telomeres. So there are special DNA sequence, there are special structure that we have not talked about, and the 
chromatin is special. So all of that taking extraordinary care to make sure that a telomere end of a chromosome does not get mistaken for a broken end. And then broken ends get repaired. There are several different pathways. Again, the cell would rather make a mistake and put two incorrect ends together than take a chance on having a deletion or a broken chromosome. So these are the major mechanisms for repair. Remember, repair is the other side of the coin to mutations created in terms of calculating mutation rates. Any last questions on DNA repair? So what we've gone through for all this chapter so far are different mechanisms by which mutations occur. Understand that now this isn't so much of a science in terms of understanding what genes are, but back in the 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, before cloning and DNA sequencing that you've grown up with, people had no clue what a gene was. After all, it wasn't until the early 1950s they even realized that the gene was DNA. So people were interested in what is a gene. And mutation was the only thing that gave them insight into what a gene was. And so a lot of energy went into mutation research. Mutation research was very important in the 1950s and 60s. All those mutagenic me mechanisms that we talked about enabled people to make different kinds of mutations. Frame shifts were very important in understanding what a reading frame was. All those mutation, all those chemicals that cause mutation were important to probe how big is a gene, where genes are. You know, before DNA sequencing, you don't know where a gene is until you mutated a piece of DNA and looked at the phenotype. That's how they got a white eye gene, was through the mutation phenotype. So it was very important to understand how mutations occur. Organisms, including you, are really well guarded against external mutations. Nothing you can do about the randomness of replication, about tautomeric shifts, about rotation, about the glycoside bond. That's spontaneous mutation. But there's a lot we can do to guard against mutations occurring from outside. We talked about radiation. We talked about chemicals, even chemicals. As long as you eat, then you're taking in chemicals which may cause mutation if you're not careful. But again, organisms have grown up, evolved in chemicals since four and a half billion years ago, four billion years ago. So the mechanisms are in place to protect against that. So what we have then is a system that guards against external damage. If you think about it, your skin, you have a dead layer of skin that you don't really care about, that wards off just absorbing dangerous chemicals. Everything you eat goes through an acid rinse and a basic rinse as your food gets digested. Everything you breathe, the air you breathe, goes into your airways. You have a mucus-lined airways with cilia sweeping all the garbage out of your lungs. It's really difficult to design a mutation experiment for animals. The easiest way is just inject it. Bypass all those safety mechanisms. Bacteria, it's easy. Bacteria don't have any of those safety mechanisms. Everything that you eat that gets into your blood, that blood from
from the colon get sent right to your liver. Your liver is your first line or your second line of defense against harmful chemicals. Each species' liver is geared to what they eat. So an herbivore that eats plants has a different spectrum of enzymes coded in the liver than does a carnivore like a lion that eats meat. We're omnivores. We have a little bit of both. The function of the liver is detoxification. Those enzymes are targeted to specific chemical structures, and those enzymes detoxify those chemicals. Of course, the downside to that is when you invent a new chemical that looks like an old chemical that's bad, there are examples where the liver cannot detoxify, but activate a harmless chemical and make it harmful. So you have all these things to consider in the area of mutation. Different species have different mutation rates. Mutations created minus mutations repaired. So there are <coughs> mutator genes. There are genes that cause mutation. <coughs> Think about it. What kind of gene can cause a mutation? Well, a repair gene. If you mutate a repair gene in bacteria, bacteria can't repair the damage anymore. For eukaryotes, you've got to make it homozygous. And so this notion of a mutator gene has come out of bacteria where it's easy to screen for mutations. So if you lose the ability to repair DNA, your mutation rate goes up. Different species have different intrinsic mutation rates. Some species have higher mutation rates than others. There's one really interesting bacteria called Dinococcus radiodurans. This bacteria, its ecological niche is in atomic piles. It lives in a radiation zone that will kill everything else. So it has no competition. When people finally sequenced the DNA in that bacteria, they were amazed at the number of DNA repair enzyme genes that that bacteria codes for. And so the number of repair genes pretty much dictates how fast mutations get repaired, what the mutation rate is going to be. So different species have different mutation rates. Your mutation rate, you carry it in general, are higher than bacteria, bacteria in general have lower mutation rates. Does that bacteria you just talked about have any other perfect repair genes, or is photoreactivation enzyme the only one we know about? Uh, as far as I know, they just use the standard set of repair genes. Uh, there's no other, I've never seen anything about any other perfect repair system. But because radiation, the major damage to radiation is it, it breaks. They have a huge number of great repair systems. <coughs> Is there another hand up? Okay, so different species have different rates of mutations. Different genes have different rates of mutations. Why do you think different genes may have different mutation rates? websites that I gave you, and you can look at how common genetic diseases are. The genetic diseases that are very common, muscular dystrophy, cystic fibrosis, those genes are huge. They go down to the bottom of the page, look at rare genetic diseases. The rare genetic diseases are caused by genes that are tiny. 
And so you can pretty much judge the size of a gene just by its mutation rate. So species have different mutation rates. Genes have different mutation rates. And within your body, not all cells have the same mutation rate. What do you think is going to make a difference between different tissues and mutation rates? How often they replicate? How often they replicate. Replication causes replication errors. It's as simple as that. So your muscles, your nerves, rarely, but not never, rarely undergo mutation rate. Cancer in muscle and nerve cells is much less frequent than skin cancer. Epithelial cells are always undergoing replication. The blood cells, the leukemias, always undergoing replication. And so the mutation rate is not a constant. It's not a constant for between species. It's not a constant within species. It's not a constant within individual cells. Yes? So, for the case of the, the reason why I was given the mutation rate, that's because of the gene size and the replication yeah, rate? Yeah, it's just, it's just target. You know, just think of a, of a target, bow and arrow. And so the big circle is easy to right. hit. The little tiny circle is tough to hit. It's exactly what it is. You have a gene with a thousand bases versus a gene with ten thousand bases. That gene with ten thousand base pairs is ten times more likely to have a random mutation. It's just that simple and straightforward. Yes. Does this take into account also uh, mutation rates that can be caused by viruses? So viruses don't typically cause mutation. And viruses do a lot of things, but mutation isn't one of them. Uh, viruses can integrate into the DNA, like Lambda, but that's not really considered a mutation. So, so I would say that viruses, we're going to talk about viruses and we talk about cancer, which is linked to mutation. But aside from that, viruses by themselves don't cause gene mutation. Anybody else? Yeah. Oh, yeah, jumping genes are perfect, absolutely. Jumping genes definitely cause mutation. But those mutations, so here we're really talking about the point mutations, the, the base pair mutations, as opposed, I mean, translocations and inversions <coughs> are mutations also, but they're in a different class. So we're talking about micro mutations now. Anybody else? Any questions? Yes. So is that just DNA have to be illustrated in order to make the lysogenic connection? So yes, if a, if a virus is going to be lysogenic, if a virus is going to integrate in, and it's a single-stranded virus, whether it's single-stranded DNA or single-stranded RNA, it has, to, it has to make itself double-stranded. Uh, HIV does that. Uh, um, some, of the, some of the bacterial viruses, I'm not sure if they integrate or not, but very definitely they have to be double-stranded. Anybody else? So what I've tried to show you is that mutations can lead to cancer. And so we're going to see a link between mutations and cancer as we go further into this. So the question becomes, how do you tell if a chemical will cause a mutation? And then we'll see, then how do you make that extension from mutation to cancer? Because mutator genes in eukaryotes cause cancer. And so that's going to be the link. That's why I put cancer into this chapter, is because cancer is a disease of mutation. So we'll start off first the easy way. How do you tell if a chemical causes a mutation? Remember, because mutations happen spontaneously, it is not enough to say,
say, oh, a mutation happened, therefore a chemical caused it. That was the problem with smoking and mutation. It was not enough to show that a person who smoked got <coughs> cancer because non-smokers got cancer also. It all had to do with the rate. And the downfall of the tobacco industry was that smokers had a higher rate of cancer. Non-smokers had the lowest rate of cancer. And reformed smokers who gave it up had an intermediate rate. So because these two are, are inimically intertwined, we're going to ask the question first, how do you tell if a chemical causes mutation? There are two very, very simple and very straightforward ways to do it, and one very expensive way. So the first way is simply by computer. So we've talked last week about a whole list of known chemicals that cause mutation. The chemical is known, the exact mechanism by which the chemical works on the DNA is known and understood. And so all that information about the structure of chemicals that are known to cause mutation is in a computer database. And there are probably tens of thousands of new chemicals that are created every year. Very, very tight regulations in virtually all countries. Any new chemical that is going to be on in the marketplace for any reason is going to be submitted to a chemical database search. If that chemical comes up clean, that's fine. That says it doesn't have a structure that resembles a known mutagen. If it doesn't come up fine, then we go on to the Ames test. So Bruce Ames is a biochemist at the University of California. And he wanted a very simple, very inexpensive test if a chemical is going to cause mutation. And so that's easy to do with E. coli. You just dump it in and squeeze the mutation. But he wanted to make this relevant to humans and cancer. So the Ames test is not just a test for mutation. It's a test for mutation that's relevant to humans and the fact that we have a liver that makes enzymes that alters the chemicals. So the Ames test is a test first in salmonella. So salmonella is a bacterium very much like E. coli, just a different species, but a related species. And the reason for using salmonella, I'll show you in just a minute or two, rather than using E. coli. So this isn't just salmonella. These are salmonella mutants. We are going to screen for revertants. So in revertant, we have the mutation. We are going to mutagenize. That is, we're going to mutate the mutant because it's easier to screen for wild type or normal. I'll show you what that means in just a minute. So, the whole test involves salmonella, but it means that we put the chemicals plus a liver extract. The liver comes from guinea pigs. The choices were humans or guinea pigs, and they decided that guinea pigs were going to be cheaper than letting people to give up their livers. Remember I said that each species has a liver that's geared to what they eat. Well, it turns out you can't use cows and pigs and sheep, all those big domesticated animals with big livers, because they're pretty much all herbivores. And their livers 
do not have the same enzymes that our liver has. It turns out that guinea pig liver enzymes most closely matches ours from an animal that's inexpensive to harvest. Yeah? Why not pigs or goats? Um, they eat anything. Yeah, they, eat, they probably eat more than a cow or pig, but they don't eat the range of meat that humans do. And, and that's the key. And so pigs and goats, while they do eat a lot of strange things, uh, their livers don't match ours. I mean, it's just that simple. They have a different enzyme spectrum. So you take the chemical and incubate it in the liver and then you add salmonella mutants. So these are the mutants they can't grow on a minimal auger plate. So this is all done by microbiology. You have an auger plate with a minimal media which forces the bacteria to make all their standard components. So a mutant can't grow, the wild type can grow. So you just incubate the mutant bacteria with the chemical that's been pre-treated by the liver, add it to the salmonella, and see if they grow on the minimal water plate. Anything that grows in a statistically significant fashion, that says that this, is, that this chemical is a potential mutagen that can alter the DNA. You got a question? Yes. So you take the mutant bacteria and you incubate them with the chemical <coughs> that's been pre-treated with a liver extract. And you see if that liver extract chemicals now can mutate the mutant. That's a reversion to revert it back to wild type. Because you're using bacteria extraordinarily powerful. You can see one in a million. And so it's a very, very sensitive asset. You want to make sure that it is statistically significant. And mutagenize And see if you can mutate it back. So you're taking something that has an AP base pair, which is mutant, and see if you can take it to a GC base pair, which is wild type. So we say it's a mutant because it changed the the. Uh, mutant or mutagen. We say that the the chemical is um, a mutagen. is a mutagen because it changed the mutant to wild type. That's what this whole chapter is, okay. is about. This taking an AT base there and changing it to GC. Absolutely. Yes.
Yeah, but you want to know that because that chemical can get into your system and through your liver and cause cancer. And so there's a very classical example of nitrites. Nitrites used to be meat preservatives until it was shown at very, very low level that your liver can activate into nitrosamines, which are potent mutagens. And so nitrites are no longer used as meat preservatives for exactly the scenario that you described. A harmless chemical that's activated by your liver. Yeah. Yeah, you want to know that for sure. Why is it that they have to use the mutated gene to go back to the wild type rather than the wild type oh. mutation? And so, so that's just a microbiology trick to save a huge amount of work. It is very difficult to take a bacteria and screen it for loss of activity. But it's very simple to take a mutant bacteria and screen it now for the ability to just grow on minimal plates. Okay, so it's just a lot easier. It's, it's, it's just easier. It saves a lot of trouble and a lot of time. Yeah, that's, it. that's all it is. It's a microbiology trick to really save time. Anybody else? Okay, so. is not one disease. We have lumped a huge number, actually that, that's grown by leaps and bounds recently, a whole huge number of genetic diseases into one category that we call cancer that all have a common behavior. And so cancer has a general range of symptoms. But understand well that each specific type, whether it's colon cancer, breast cancer, skin cancer, all of those, each one is a different genetic disease, which means a different set of genes. Cancer is not a single gene disease like muscular dystrophy. Cancer is multigenic. That means in order for a cell to become cancerous, you have to have multiple mutations. And each cancer type has a different set of mutations. The most recent data says that even within a supposedly homogeneous type of cancer, and breast cancer is one of the most better explored types, that there are a lot of different subtypes. And what's important about different subtypes of breast cancer is that a drug that will work on subtype A will not work on subtype B, because the gene that drug works on in subtype A is not mutant in subtype B. So this is what we're going to be exploring over the next several days is what exactly is cancer. So cancer is not a single disease. Cancer is first a genetic disease. It is caused by mutations. It is above all regulation problem. It is a disease caused by genes that are not properly regulated. We already talked about some of those genes and how they cause misregulation, how those genes affect the cell. This is all about <coughs> growth control. You think about it, cancer is a genetic disease where the cell is not obeying the growth control mechanism, that G1 to S mechanism that we talked about. The cell
know is ignoring those checkpoints and just literally growing out of control. In addition, another one is no contact inhibition. Contact inhibition is neat. It's all about what happens in your cells when cells in a tissue are communicating with each other. The cells in your skin, your liver, your muscle, whatever tissue you have, all the time, cell-cell contact means cells are in constant communication with each other. They have to be in order to repair damage if there's a wound, a cut, and cells have to be replaced. So every morning when you wake up, all your cells are talking to each other. Hi, how are you? Okay, I'm fine. How's Charlie over there? He's good too. Okay, you can go back to sleep now. Literally, cells are communicating to each other from cell to cell contact, proteins on the cell surface. Talked about proteins on the cell surface. They serve all sorts of functions. As long as the cell in a tissue or organ gets a signal from all of its neighbors that everything is okay, it's just going to sit there. But if it's damaged, if a neighbor is damaged, if it's cut, if it's wounded, that's a signal, well, maybe I need to replicate and replace Charlie because he looks like he's dead now. <laughs> and so if that contact inhibition, remember, you have to inhibit growth. If that mechanism of growth inhibition is gone, that means the cell starts to grow uncontrolled. And so we have two different growth very different growth control pathways. One coming out of master glands, growth factors that were working when you were still a little kid, getting bigger, 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 and that's pretty much shut down now. So um, does it think like Charlie's still dead, so let's just keep replicating, or is it, it never heard about it, so it's just replicating without caring? So it's a negative system. Okay. So when you've lost a negative system, uh, it just says, okay, we should start growing now. Because I should have gotten a signal to stop, and I didn't. And that's literally the way that works. Anybody else? Okay. So let's see. All of these things are hallmarks of cancer. Where does cancer come from? First of all, cancer is familiar. Everybody in this room should know that. Familial means that cancer is genetic, and because it's genetic, there is an inherited component. <coughs> what this means is everybody should know their family history. There is a component of cancer that is heritable, that you can inherit. And again, breast cancer is the best example of that. So we are talking about recessive genes. A recessive gene means that a mutation in that gene does not show up in the phenotype until the other allele is mutated. The story with a significant fraction, no, a small fraction of breast cancer, and again, that's the best example because there's the most data on it, is that a significant portion of breast cancers are 
an inheritor. That means that if someone in your family, in a blood line in your family, has had breast cancer, that means that you are at risk. Does it mean you don't get it? Because you're getting one allele from one parent, the other allele from the other parent. And that individual, the relative, may not have both alleles mutated, but if they have one allele mutant, then you may get that. If you get a mutant allele that causes cancer, breast cancer or anything, what that means is that every cell in your body has that mutant allele. And all it takes is for one mutation at that locus to now create a homozygous situation. Familial cancer is only 5%. So this is American cancer statistics. But even that 5% can be avoided if you know your genetic history. There are all sorts of genes for which the data is very, very well understood. So that's one aspect of inheriting cancer, but only 5%. There's a second way, and the second way is actually pretty interesting. It used to be thought years and years and years ago that there was something called immune surveillance. That your immune system, that you were constantly getting cancers, and your immune system wiped them out. And the cancer only appeared when one escaped the immune system. But that fell by the wayside. <coughs> What's replaced it is, is even more interesting. How many people have allergies? Wow, you guys are lucky. The statistics say that, that immune surveillance is pretty important. That people who have allergies, especially strong allergies, have a lower probability, I guarantee, a lower probability of getting cancer. That Cancer cells are different from your normal cells. When a cell becomes cancerous, that cell reverts to an embryonic state. After all, when you were an embryo, your cells were replicating fast, as cancer does. And so cancer reprograms the genes to behave like a, an embryo cell. That's become so important now that a very, very good line of defense when people have cancer is to remove a tumor and then literally immunize, your, immunize that person with that tumor extract. That is to hyperactivate your immune system. And that's been working pretty well for certain cancers. With the allergy, don't you, you get an allergy
<laughs> I, yeah, I, you know, the story that I, that I read is that the more hyper your immune system, the better off you're going to be protected against the tumor form. And so this familial has two components to it. You can inherit one class of genes that we're going to talk about probably on Wednesday. One class of genes that can lead to cancer, not cause cancer, but not prevent cancer. So when they're taken out. So when you inherit cancer, you don't inherit a type of cancer, you inherit cancer as a any type. Um, when you inherit cancer, you inherit susceptibility typically to a to a very small spectrum. Uh, it, it's, it's really odd, and, and so we have to get into the pathway to see that. But most genes are very general, except for the contact inhibition one. Growth control, both are very specific. Most of the cancer causing genes are very general, yet they cause very specific cancers. And we'll see that on Wednesday. That, that's all I can say easily now. Someone else had a hand up over there? Okay, so familial means that you can inherit genes that increase your probability of cancer. Secondly, Environmental. So environmental really simply means that you choose to get cancer by the environment you're in. And the, the two environments of choice when you want to get cancer are smoking and sunbathing. I mean, it's just that simple. There is no question now, even the cigarette companies have given up, they acknowledge that the chemicals in burning leaves that get into your system, those are chemicals that cause damage to DNA. Chemicals that damage the DNA are mutagens. When you smoke, you are inhaling mutagenic chemicals. End of story. You already know the sunbathing story. You know the damage that ultraviolet light does. How people can go in and pay a tanning salon to give them cancer is absolutely beyond me. Again, by 
American Cancer Society statistics. So the environment really is important, but it's not important for people who are careful, especially about smoking and sunbathing. You take that out of the equation, and this number drops dramatically. Any questions on that? Virus. Viruses are really interesting. I used to stand up here years and years ago and say viruses cause virtually no cancers in humans. We now know, we now identify a number of viruses that cause cancer. And so that number is now up around 15%. So viruses really come in two different flavors. That is, two major categories of viruses that cause cancer. The big double-stranded DNA viruses and the small single-stranded RNA. So this is double-stranded DNA and single-stranded RNA virus. But that's still <coughs> a, a tiny percent, a small percent, of cause of cancer <coughs> in humans. There are other species where viruses are the major pathway to cancer. Cats, for example, the major cause of cancer in cats, if you're a cat lover, you probably know this, are, are RNA tumor viruses that cause cancer in cats. Birds are another group of organisms that for some unknown reason, birds and cats are very, very susceptible through RNA tumor virus. DNA, virus. DNA tumor virus is less so across the species line. When I say cats, I mean everything from your house cat to the lions and tigers. Cancer, when, when it's cancer in a cat, it is invariably due to viral causes. Uh, dogs, much less than cats. So I haven't seen dogs on that same list, although I've, I've known people whose dogs have had cancer. But I don't think it's the same extent as it is uh, for cats. Anybody else? And so for us, for humans, it isn't even the RNA tumor viruses that cause cancer in humans the way they do in cats and birds, it's the other major class, the double-stranded DNA viruses, uh, the HPV, is probably the best known right now, uh, as a, as a so probably the major, one of the major viruses, but again, it's still only 15% of the total human cancer load. And there's now, uh, there, there's now a, uh, a vaccine against HPV, HPV causes cancer not just in women, but in men also. And so this is a virus that is easily transmitted. Any questions on that? When we come back, what we're going to focus on is information 